Good morning, everyone. I thought I'd put up the uh, rest of the grocery inventory I did for the wife. Uh, we hadn't gone through it in a couple weeks. I've been kind of busy and done much, uh, but I've kind of finished it up in my spare time without, you know, kind of I, I, one of the recordings messed up, so I'm basically having to start over after doing all the work. Um, so, in essence, there's a couple, two, three things from a design-wise or a step-wise that I do that a lot of a lot of uh, uh, developers may do themselves, may not, may do it a different way. It's not written in stone. You can do it either direction. But let's kind of go over what I do, and that may help you when you start looking at developing your version of a mobile device. Now, this one here is Android at the moment. We're going to turn around, and uh, I'm going to set up um, my... Uh, um, computer over here for the for the iOS version and I will do a video on getting it side loaded you know compiled and side loaded on a device okay uh, we'll not go through a video trying to get it up on the uh, Apple play at all uh, that that would I'm too old <laughs> to go through that again um, eventually I may do it, but right at the moment I'm trying to avoid the iOS as much as possible, especially the Apple Play because of the nightmare that they put you through trying to get it done. If anybody really knows Apple and knows how to get through all that and want to do a video, have at it. I'll be glad to put it up for you. Okay? All right, so let's kind of go over this. Uh, the couple things that I do is is that I've, I've determined that using planes in uh, uh, in a mobile application is 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 a smart move. Okay, now that doesn't mean everything is in one form. That's not the case. Uh, everything is not in one form. It's it's in a couple of way way I've got it. So. You can do this, and it will work out very nicely when you're working with things. Now, of course, you've got to make sure that as you go through each of these planes, you know where you're at, you know which planes you're on, things like this. If you haven't messed with planes at all, planes are different layers of a window, and you can have as many as you want. The great thing about it is, is that, uh, and I showed you, showed a lot of planes in the TCI inspection uh, video, is it really allows you to formulate uh, much better setups for what you're doing. It really does. Okay, allows you to work through a lot of different things. So. Here I've got the login template, and I've got an email and password, which is pretty simple to do, and you've got to log in and you've got to register. Well, the register, what it does is it pops to the second one. It pops to the second plane. You can see the two pop up there. Now you've got an email, password, verify, name. Now these two are the same as what's on one. How do I do that? Well, when you click on these two and you say associate with a plane, you notice that it's checkboxed in both items. All you have to do is down to hold down the control key, and it will go to each one of them. If I hold down the control key and I've got a three and hit OK, well, if I go to three, I'm back and see. You can see both fields are there. That's the way it works. It's pretty neat. Uh, it may not work 100% of the time due to positioning where you need to have the field, but if the field can be uh, laid out in the same exact place on multiple fields, uh, multiple uh, planes. This is a smart way to do it. So think about that as you design your screen and exactly how things go. Uh, register, all it does is basically switch to the plane. So it does a my window plane equals two, which pops to the second plane. You're done. So let's go through the code that this comes up with. Login. We are going to do a couple things. We've got a mobile class. If you remember right, we wrote a mobile class. It's got several different little functions in there, and we'll go through the mobile class here in just a few moments just to, just to review everything. And we're calling them validate login with the email and the password that's being sent. We're going to return a true or false. If it's false, we're going to say, yep, you blew it. Try it again. Or we're going to assign the user record 
to the global user so that way we have their name and information through the whole thing and we're going to open up the w inventory screen okay there is a mobile open mobile and those but those are a little bit different it does not stop the execution of this screen which i just assume transfer the full execution that's why i use open all right so let's go through the mobile class the mobile class has several different methods and stuff to it as well as some structures in the top I've come to the you know come to find out that that a good chunk of classes in the mobile area actually works better using structures than uh, classes um, we do use a class in here uh, that is inventory item I've got it in here but you'll see later on in some of the code where I've had to manually assign each value as it comes across uh, and that's due to it's not actually mapping it out correctly it's not doing the internal mapping correctly so uh, instead of doing that I just have to assign each value and then it works uh, a structure I haven't had to do that if I remember right in TCI inspections I didn't do that I didn't have to so it worked out finally um, so my suggestion is you can use the class if it's only elements as you can see here or just cut and paste it and make a structure with it up here as I did with the inventory owners structure okay I've got a help structure up there and then I've got an inventory area so this the inventory area basically is a drop list of which areas that they've typed in okay let's go on down load help is fairly simple we've got a local uh, hyperfile uh, file for this application it runs through the HF inventory file uh, if it's named help it'll pull it back up uh, and says okay what's in the JSON directory if it's in the JSON directory uh, we do that otherwise we de deserialize the help and put it into the array that way we've got it all in there we're done that's done early on registration we're calling a restful call here to add change or delete an inventory owner right at the moment it's really just adding one uh, the change will be happening in there if it finds it but we have to do a certain things number one is we have to assign the user record to JSON so that gives us a JSON layout of the entire registration record we do the rest request URL that we're calling tell it it's a type by JSON and we're putting the JSON record in the content and we're going to post it because that's what we did with the with the restful call if you're not doing a post you don't have to determine content type or content because it ignores it or, or, or blows up either direction it just doesn't like it uh, resp is response that's my response rest send and send the request and if I get back anything out of that and the contents not equal to blank then I'm getting back uh, the content so I'm assigning the content to my return JSON record and then assigning it to each one of the fields and doing a result equals true otherwise the whole thing is false if it comes back as false it's saying eh, registration didn't work you're going to have to try it another way that's the way it works next one is validate login well we just went through this well we're doing the same thing now what we're doing here is a verified login restful call where we're sending the user ID and sending the password if you refer back to the earlier video you should be able to see all of the restful calls uh, over there the restful programming that goes with it there's a couple of new ones which we'll go through here a little bit later but we won't go through everything uh, again same thing we're doing a rest request the difference is we got to get you can see there's no type no nothing on there so we're fine bring that back if it's blank we're going to return a false and say hey didn't get nothing that's where you get your error saying invalid login and start over otherwise we're going to sign it to our return JSON and if there's an error exists because I do return a error then I'll say okay that's a false also 
then when we assign everything to the user record and result is true. Fetch inventory. Fetch inventory happens. We want to get all of the person's inventory items that she, that, that she has uh, for, for the home inside uh, an array locally. And this is what I'm doing here. Uh, this is also a get. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward. It's uh, uh, do the rest request, call the fetch inventory with a user ID, do a get, get the response back. I'm going to I'm going to create a record for the inventory item, and I'm going to then assign the content to the JSON. Delete everything in AAR data. That's my array of data coming back. And at that point, loop through everything in the in the return JSON, assign the values, and add it to the array. All right. If the array is greater than zero, in other words, we have more than one record, we're going to load inventory now. Here's where a little bit of the difference is. Load inventory does a couple of things. There's two things that we got to build once we get the data. One, we have to build the inventory area, so whether it's kitchen, freezer, you know, pantry, whatever it may, may need to be, uh, outside garage, whatever she puts in there, we got to build those, okay? And then the second thing we're doing is is building up the groceries. Ah, what are we doing with groceries? Well, it doesn't do a whole lot of do, good to do inventory if you're not going to sit there and give her a list of what she needs to buy at the store in order to make everything back the way it is. That's why we have a par count in here with saying, okay, I want five items of this. Well, I only got three, so you need to buy two. That's what we're doing here. So we go through the uh, each of the array data records, and we're assigning it to the area. We're assigning the rec area to the inventory area. And I'm looking in the array of the areas to see if that is already there. If that is not already there, that's where the negative one comes in, then I'm going to add it to the area. Now, the next thing I'm going to check is I'm going to check to see if the par count, which is the count of what she wants to keep in inventory, is greater than the inventory count, which is what she currently has in inventory. If that's the case, We'll go see if that's in the groceries, and if it's in the groceries, we'll add it. So in case she puts it in twice in two different areas, it will give a good sum. But it doesn't change the par count. The par count stays the same. And what it does then is assigns that if it finds it to the current groceries. Otherwise, we're going to add it to the groceries. And that gives us a complete area of a listing of the groceries for her to, her to uh, uh, get. The other thing we do at the end is we add a new inventory area to summary, so that way when somebody wants to take a look at it, they can look at it, and everything is good. Find item. Okay. When we're doing something here, what the find item does is you have a swipe capability on the on the device. Now I can't show you the swipe capability on the, you know on a test mode, but I can. I can I can tell you what it does. When you swipe it to the right, uh, you have a couple of choices. There's one deal that says, do you want to delete? But when I'm on the grocery list, what I want her to be able to do is that when she buys eggs, she can swipe the eggs to the right, take it off the list as she's got it, and what it will do then is put the par count equal to the inventory count. So if she's supposed to get two cartons of eggs, and the inventory count is uh, one, and the par count is three, then what will happen is, is it will now make the inventory count, when she swipes it to the right, equal to the three, automatically. And all we're doing here is we're doing the par count is equal, we're telling it change, and then we're calling the ACD inventory and doing it and deleting it from the array of groceries because the array of groceries is only groceries that don't match the par count. Okay? Fetch summary. Now, fetch summary is a little bit different. Okay? One of the things that I wanted to do in the, in the uh, fetch summary was created, I created a view in the database. 
And the view in the database, what it does is let you do basically a SQL statement to kind of tell you how you want to view the data. It's non-editable. You're not going to be able to edit it, but this kind of helps. So one of the views that I get or uh, that I have is saying, okay, let me give you everything. This is a summary of everything, no matter where you got it, by the same name, by the same name. So if we're looking at the view, and I'll show it to you here, the view is this. Select the owner, the item description, the sum of the inventory kind of sum, and select the max par count. So if she happens to have a two on one and a four on the other, she's going to get four from the inventory item. If you have questions for SQL statements, that you're just now getting into SQL, you're just now getting into all that, please post it up on our Facebook. Uh, bottom line is, is that there are quite a few uh, SQL uh, proficient individuals on our group, as well as myself, uh, Pete Halstead, uh, in multiple different SQL languages, like uh, uh, MySQL, Postgres, even Oracle and uh, uh, obviously MS SQL. So we all we know it very well. We'll be able to help you get through whatever you need to get through. Okay. So I created this view, and and if you run the view, it gives me a direct set of records that I'm looking for. Now, when you do call the view, all I have to do is call that VW summary item summary. That's all I need. I don't need anything else. So I can do a select. Get over here. that in there and I'm going to get 54 rows and you can see that I've got everything that I've got in there and it's got all of the sums are all set up and that's what she gets on her summary list. Pretty simple. Okay, so once I do that, I delete everything out of the summer area or summary and then I have for each uh, record of the JSON that came back, I'm going to assign it to each one of the values and assign it to the array. So I refresh the memory that way, okay? ACD inventory. ACD inventory, we kind of went through this already. Uh, well, actually we didn't. We went through the uh, uh, validate. I'm gonna go through this. Um, the JSON inventory, what we're doing here is we're sending an inventory record. It's in the inventory is inventory item. The inventory item is the class for the inventory item. We're assigning that entire thing to the JSON record. Now, what that will be is the JSON record now holds, as a variant, every one of those fields like we want it to be. The return record is what we're getting back from them. Now, in my RESTful calls, if I send a record to the database, to the RESTful calls, I return that record with any values that may be changed. So if it's an insert, I'm going to get the ID of the insert when that happens for the primary key. This is what I want. So that's the reason why I return it all the time. The, then we do the request. We got the URL for ACD inventory. And the content type is JSON, content JSON record. On down the line, get the response. If we don't have any issues, we then assign that to the ret JSON, and what we do at the moment is we're going to look through the AER data as linear first, the ID of the return JSON ID. Okay? We assign all the values either direction. If the action type is add, I'm going to add the record. If it's in change, and this is where this statement comes, comes to play on line 16, if the index is greater than zero, then I'm going to update the record in the array. If not, I'm going to add it. So if some reason somebody said they changed it, but it's gone or something like that, then it kind of fixes things on its own, self-healing. And then you got the delete, which says just we're going to get rid of it. Of course, then we reload the inventory. This is the same thing we went back to uh, the same uh, situation. We, we go right back to it. And then we display data, whatever the current inventory record is. Now, display data. 
display data, what it does is now we have in the full on record structures or the arrays, we have every record in the database that belongs to us in our array. Well, obviously, we're not going to always show everything in pantry and freezer and, and kitchen, all three at the same time. Uh, you could, that's where the summary comes in, but uh, it it's kind of defeats the purpose. If I want to see what's in my pantry, uh, then I want to only look for the pantry. Well, the way to do that is display data, where I send what area am I in? Am I in the kitchen? Am I in the pantry? Am I in the freezer? And when I do, I delete everything out of the inventory, and then I go into a loop of each one of the records of AR data, and if the inventory area matches the one I got, I add it to the AR inventory and display. The only exception to that is if they chose summary. If they chose summary, I'm going to check to see if we got any summary. If not, we're going to go refetch it. Otherwise, we're going to copy, array copy, the entire array for summary into the AR inventory. And what that does there is give her the summary. And this is how it all works. So we're going to run this thing a little bit. Don't email my wife. Uh, <laughs> uh, did you, did you? Log in. And then we got we got an ad in the grocery list. If I want to go down to summary, I click this, and you can see what I've got here is I've got everything in the everything we got there and how it's setting up, how much bacon, bananas, whatever she's got in there. And then I can click back to inventory, and it takes me right back here. If I'm looking in the freezer, it gives me the description, the count, and the par for each one of them. This is where you do your edits. All right. This has everything in it. If I choose to change the kitchen, I'll get whatever's in the kitchen. If I do cleaning supplies, it's whatever she's got in her cleaning supplies and things like this. Grocery list, it's fairly straightforward. Grocery list is just what is the item and what is she supposed to buy? If this is the case, this is where the slide comes in because if I could slide it, I would slide it to the right and it would automatically update those, those matters. So she takes this to the, the store and this is how she buys. Now, Obviously, she don't always buy everything that's on the list. Okay, she could, but she doesn't need to because we don't do briskets every weekend, and we don't do uh, beef ribs, you know, every ribs, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, if we're looking for something in there, and we say, hey, let's 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 cook up some ribs next week. Or, or brisket next week, and she looks at it and says, okay, I've got one in there. I've got full up in there. We don't need to do anything. But the next time we need to buy one, then she knows what she needs to buy. Okay? And this is, she kind of likes it this way. It works great. It works great. Back to inventory again. This is it in a nutshell. There's really just nothing more extensive than this. There's only one other piece I want to show you, show you, which is when you ch change the count. So let's go into W inventory. Now, this has got the same thing. As you can see, I'm running planes again. You can see the one, two, three, four, four different planes I'm using. That's what I'm using. I've also got it set up for multiple layouts, depending upon whether you're using tablet, phone, even iOS. Okay? So it's all set up for that. The biggest question that you have is, okay, well, how do I change the value of that I used one of the items? In each one of these fields, I have written a little bit of code. And what I do then is assign the record structure to whatever one I currently have in the loop, in the in loop inventory. And the way that works is pretty simple. I've set up the content here to be the mobile class array inventory, and the stored variable is the entire record. That's how you do it. Just do the current element, the entire thing, and it'll bring back the pointer of whatever the class is. Pretty straightforward. Now, in doing that, what I have now is the entire record. I have the entire record for that. Then I want to assign the current inventory count that they just changed. 
So if it went from 2 to 1, it's going to go from 2 to 1. And then I do an e-change, and I send it to the ACD inventory. The add change to lead inventory. That updates it. We're done. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty slick doing it that way and easy. Same thing with the PAR. Uh, the PAR would, you know, if you want to change it up, the PAR, I don't have it in there right now. i got to do that. In fact, let's just go ahead and do that because it wouldn't be that hard. I'm just going to literally copy this code, and I'm going to put it in the PAR side. Now, I'm going to do it as we exit. What is the difference that I've got to do? Well, I'm not changing the inventory count. I'm changing the PAR count. So I've got to change these two items. So now, if she changes it, that she says, okay, I usually only have two, but I need to have three from now on for whatever reason, or we don't hardly eat these, let's drop these down to zero, or we're not going to buy any more of them, uh, then um, this is an easy way to do it. Just absolutely an easy way to do it. Everything's set up. All said and done. There's nothing any more particularly special about what I've done here as far as the application is concerned. There's nothing particularly any more fancier or that I need to do elsewhere. I'm going to switch it over to the RESTful, and we'll go through a few of these. ACD Inventory Owner. Remember I said about using if test mode is true, that I have a test string and everything? What I basically did here was set up uh, a test deal that works. No, it's not hers. That's not correct anymore. Um, and uh, uh, then assigned it. I either use the test string if I'm testing it locally, or I assign it to the web service parameter. So let's, let's say I'm going to use mine and create one. I can do this and put in a password of, okay? Modified DAPE, action type one, we're good. So what's gonna happen here is if I hit the go button and it's in test mode, gonna hit the run the procedure here. Steps there, steps, gets the test string makes the JSON equal to the test string instead. So it's just like sending it from uh, through the application. And I always test this in basically three phases, if possible. Number one, I test it like this locally to make sure that everything works around the web service parameters. So that way I've got the save record, I've got the return JSON, the whole nine yards. I know that works. The second thing is, is when you publish this, you also get a test page. I utilize that test page to test it the second phase. So that way I know that when it comes across the internet, this is what I'm returning. This is what I'm getting back. So I'll put in the same user ID and password. Boom, I've got, I've got the proper one to do. Uh, you can also have it set up to where you can just put in the entire JSON that you're sending it, and it will work as well. That gives you the test that you need to have on the, on the Internet side. The final test is actually in the application itself. That's when I'm running it, and I'm making sure that I have no code errors there as well. If you, if you do it from the simplest to the more complicated, your life and your, and your stress level will be a whole lot easier. Okay, uh, this is straight code with direct to the database, so this isn't entirely rocket science. It's it's the same thing you do in any of the applications for WinDev, WebDev, and so you'll be able to understand what you're trying to do here. Okay, uh, test that out first, then you test it on the internet to make sure there's nothing given it fits that direction, and the final test is from the mobile device itself. That's what you do. Okay, send that test because I don't want to have my name in there anyway. 
Uh, we've done the verify login, which we've gone through this before, where I'm basically doing a SQL statement where the user ID and the password match and return a true or a false, one of the two. Fetch inventory. Fetch inventory is, again, very straightforward. We're sending in the owner ID, which is, which is basically the primary key ID of the user. And we're saying get all the data, assign the array to the return JSON. This is a kind of a fairly new thing since 24. It used to be uh, we'd have to serialize it or something like this. We don't have to anymore. I've got a JSON variable. By setting up the JSON and making it equal to the array, I've got an array of the JSON right there. ACD inventory item, we go back to the same thing. I'm testing the ACD inventory item. I'm putting in what I want to have in there, a test of it, and I'm going through the same steps exactly of what I went through for the user. Okay? Fetch summary. You remember me telling you about the view creates uh, the view creates summary. Here is the same SQL statement that basically I did on the other one. The only difference is, is I'm saying here's the owner ID I want to use. Okay? So I do the where statement. I get it. I fetch the data. Again, same thing. Return JSON is this. And it should be a result ret JSON. Okay? And we're good to go. That's what fetch summary will do. And that's basically it. We're done. We're done with this. Application works nicely. Uh, again, uh, you can certainly... Uh, I'm going to back up the code, put it up there on the uh, uh, um, Dropbox for everybody. We'll uh, also um, make sure that if you want to, if you actually want to use it to play with it and stuff, you certainly can. Just put in your own user ID and password, email address, user ID and password. Put in a few things on there, see how it works from that standpoint as you're trying to build your mobile program. Uh, use a lot of the same type features. If you need more security, reach out to either myself or Pete, and we'll certainly give you examples as well as a methodology for, for uh, more security ways of like having to send a token with it, a token that expires after a certain period of time, uh, things like this. Okay. One of the things I am working on because I have to do it for DAT is a token with an automatic exp uh, uh, expiration. It's pretty easy actually. We're going to I'm going to hash a you know name of the company with a date and the date is prior or a time is prior to what this currently is then boom they can't you know the token is no longer valid. And I can check that on either side of the coin. So when I get that done, I'm actually going to show you that. I think I'll take a video of, uh, of uh, how I did that, so that way you guys can see how to do a little bit more security methodology inside of your RESTful calls. Uh, luckily, this is me to me, or it's a training thing, so I'm not overly worried about whether somebody hacks the database. Uh, not likely they're going to be able to. Uh, uh, they would have to really jump through some hoops to do it. but. Uh, uh, it, it, everything should be fine. At least the security minister, I'm not going to lose anything for it. Um, thanks for coming in. I guess, again, um, we're going to go through the iOS development on this to set it up. Okay. One of the things here that uh, you may or may not have noticed is there is a uh, a deal pops up when you compile this to a deploy. If you have your Android device plugged into your computer and you have debug turned on, must have debug turned on, whether it's the phone or whatever it may be, then what you can do at that point in time is you can compile the Android and that's what I'm going to do right now. i got a couple ways to do it. I can sit there and say debug on the mobile device, which will automatically copy it over. Now, this creates actually a different EXE than the one that you're going to distribute. It creates a Go space 
logical name of the program and deal. So you have two different ones on your machine. If you look on your Android device after doing this and then creating the live one and putting it over there, you'll see there's two applications there. Keep that in mind. You may want to delete the other one when you've done your finalization. Give it a few moments to finish this and I'll show you how it works. Now this this to me is a very simplistic application. I mean it's nothing hard, but it'll certainly give you a good step up from what you need to you know develop uh, to start with. It'll give you some foundations to work with, is what it'll do, which is what you need. Checking my device here. Once it's attached and everything, well, basically at this point in time, it is currently running in my system. I can actually go to the code and say stop there. And I'm granted you can't see me putting it in on the device, but I'm putting in her user ID and password. And what it'll do is when I hit the login, it's going to stop right there. You see where it stopped? So now I can step by step if I want to. And you can see what it did. And once you hit the go button, it'll actually switch and you're off and running again. I've got all the areas and it's showing me the different things on the tablet itself. That's how you can debug a little bit of the code inside uh, your application still tied to the actual physical device. It's a pretty neat little feature, okay? Um, and of course, the end test is the end test. Now, side loading it onto your Android device is even easier. All I need to do is go to project, hit generate. You get the usual generation up there when it does it for the latest version. And we'll let that rock and roll. And eventually, I have a little blue box up here that says deploy. Now, this, like I said, this is for side loading, basically, side loading it onto the device. You may have multiple devices, like sometimes I run my Andy. Uh, Android here on the side to do both, you know, test on uh, a phone and a tablet both. Be done here in just a moment. Is there anything? Looking to see if there's anything else I need to discuss here with y'all. No, no, okay. All right. Okay, as you can see, the deploy popped up because it's ready. It's compiled. If I click this, it's going to give me a screen, and you can see it shows my Samsung T290 Android 10 DPI. What's my screen resolution? 800 by 1280. Um, this this kind of gives me the fit and everything to it, and I can say, okay, go ahead and install. And it's going to install the application automatically. I've installed it on that device. I can give it to my wife. She's off and running. We're done. Pretty simple. And it'll fire up on the device, and I can see it on the device as we move forward. Okay? That's about it for today. Now, like I said, I've got to set up uh, my uh, Apple computer over here. It's been down, set down for a little while. Uh, I've got to get it fired back up and get it working and everything. I figured out how to record off of it by just using my uh, um, Connect stuff, uh, my support, 
and we can watch it go through its process. Now, I can promise you I'm going to go through it once before I do it and videotape you guys. Uh, and I'll try to, and I'm going to write down everything that I kind of got in my way as I went along uh, the path. As far as, like I said, with the Apple uh, account and all of that, um, I do not know that well. It was already pre-set up the last one I did, and I required help on more than one occasion. So I'm not the guru of that by any stretch of the imagination. If anybody else does have a lot of information on how to get through the iOS issues uh, and the Apple Store issues, uh, feel free to holler at me. Uh, feel free to make a video and uh, uh, let me know, and I'll make sure it's up there in the correct area where it needs to go. Okay? Other than that, y'all have a wonderful day. Thanks a lot for your time. Uh, y'all be good to be good at it. Source code and everything will be up momentarily. Bye.